good evening. It's good to see you uh, this evening on a beautiful Lord's Day and that you've come back to be with us this, uh, this evening. We're grateful for that. Uh, the lesson this evening is going to be on resisting the devil. God, uh, keep in mind, God has never told us anything to do that we're not capable of doing. God will not ask us to do something we're not capable of. He is a righteous God, He's a loving God, and He will judge us in righteousness. Therefore, He will not ask of us anything that we're not capable of doing. For Him to do so would make Him unrighteous. Keep in mind, I want to repeat what I just said but in a different way. If God asks us to do something, or commands us to do something that we cannot do, and then judges us accordingly, that would make him unrighteous. And God is not unrighteous. God is righteous. God is good. Therefore, all things that he's commanded us to do or asked us to do are things we're capable of. On the other hand, the devil will tell you, no, you can't do that, or you're incapable of doing that, or... You don't have the talent to do that, or you don't have the strength to do that. Anything of a negative nature in that regard is going to be from the devil. God's telling us we can do that. As a matter of fact, God even tells us that He is with us and will help us to do the things that He's asked us to do. Lo, well, I'm with you always, for instance. Why is he with me? Because he loves me? Because he helps me through the times when I need help? He lifts us up on eagle's wings. He gives us strength to carry on. He helps us. As a matter of fact, Paul tells us, I am able to do what? All things. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That should be sufficient to tell you you're capable of doing whatever God asks you to do. So when we're told in Scripture to resist the devil, that means that's something you can do. It doesn't mean that you want to, but it is something you can do. Let's make sure we understand that. It is something that we can do. And God's asked us to do that. Turn with me to James chapter 1. That's where the primary lesson is going to be coming from this evening. James chapter 1. And we're going to break these scriptures down. James chapter 1, starting with verse 19, and we're going to be reading through 27 as we go along this evening's lesson. James chapter 1, starting with verse 19. And those listening on the internet, I hope that you're turning in your Bible with us and read along with us as we study. First of all, let's read verses 19 and 20 together. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. How do I resist the devil? He's telling you right there. Be swift to hear the word of God. Swift doesn't mean I'm listening to it real quick. and I'm not, I ain't, It means I'm anxious. I'm desiring to hear it. I would rather hear the word of God, focus on what I need to do, than just carry on. And run my mouth. I want to be careful what I say. I want to be careful what I do. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 1 as a companion scripture here. It helps us to understand what he's talking about. Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God. And be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. You're going to be a Christian, you want to be a Christian, you want to go to the house of God and worship, you want to do things, then you need to be careful what you're saying and what you're doing. Slow to speak, swift to hear. I'm anxious to hear God's word. I want to hear God's word. I want to know that what I'm doing is right. I want to be slow to respond. How am I resisting the devil? The devil wants me to do otherwise. The devil doesn't want me to listen to the Word of God, number one. Number two, he wants me to run off at the mouth. How many times do we see people out in the world, even in movies we see this, when they start to get into trouble or conflict or something, what do they do? They start running off at the mouth, don't they? 
They start yelling. They start saying things that are slanderous or mean or evil. They start the fight, and that, that's one of the things we teach our children, isn't it? You know, you keep your mouth closed, you're going to be in less trouble. Right? God's saying the same thing. You, keep, you be slow to respond. You think about what you're going to say. I'm resisting the devil when I do that because the devil wants me to fly off the handle. He wants me to get angry real quick. I want to be slow to respond. And I want to be slow to wrath. Number one, God says that he's responsible for the wrath. You know, avenge not. Vengeance is mine, God says. God will take care. I'm not supposed to do anything. I'm supposed to do good for my enemies, aren't I? I love my enemies. That's what I'm supposed to be doing. That's the one way I'm resisting the devil. Because I'm not listening to what he wants. I'm listening to what God wants. Look at verse 2, Ecclesiastes 5. Be not rash with thy mouth. See how this is going right along with what James is saying? Be not rash with thy mouth. Don't run off at the mouth. Think about what you're saying. What, how are our words supposed to be? They're supposed to be seasoned with salt. They're supposed to be filled with grace. I'm supposed to speak kind and good. And if any man teach, let him teach us the oracles of God. I need to be saying things that edify my neighbor and edify my brother and sister in Christ. I need to be saying things that help the world to see that I'm a child of God and know what they need to be doing. I need to be glorifying God with what I'm saying. See, I'm resisting the devil when I think about what I'm saying, when I say what my heart is telling me to say, rather than what my emotions tell me to say. Listen to more of what Ecclesiastes says. And let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. God is everywhere. God is always watching. Do we think about that as we go along? When we go to say something, when we go to do anything, well, regardless of what it is, are we thinking about the fact that God's watching what we're doing? Do we think when we go off and hide somewhere, or we talk in whispers in a corner somewhere, that God's not listening? He most certainly is listening. We need to be careful what we say. For God is in heaven and thou upon the earth. Therefore let thy words be few. Again, he's going right along with what James is saying. Slow to speak. Choose your words wisely. That helps me to resist the devil. Because the devil wants me to do just the opposite. Number two. Point number two, be ready to receive the word of God. Look at verse 21 of James, 121. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Are you listening to what James is saying? Lay apart all filthiness. Put aside the things of the world. But besides sin, we can look at other scriptures that tells us all the things that are worldly and vulgar that God does not like. Fornication, lying, adultery, and the list goes on and on. The things that God does not like. Lay those things aside and receive with meekness. Be humble. You see, if I'm not humble, I'm not going to listen to what God has to say to me. I'm not going to listen to His words. I'm not going to listen to what he He's telling me to do because I'm, I don't, I'm better than that, I think to myself. Just like in Thessalonians, I set myself up, at, up as God in my heart and I don't listen to Him. That's not being meek. I need to be meek. I need to bow down and be humble and receive with word, receive instruction, teaching me what's right and what's wrong. Paul said, I have not known sin except the law teach me. We don't know what's right and wrong if we don't listen to what the words tell us. In my humility, in my humbleness, I'm going to listen to God because I know He has the greater good in mind for me. 
See, the devil wants to say otherwise. Oh, you can do this on your own. You don't need God. Well, there isn't a God. You're your own ruler. You came from slime somewhere past in the history of the world, and, and there really isn't a God. See, that's what he wants me to think. So if there is no God, I have no one to answer to but myself. That's what the devil wants me to think. He's trying to tell me I don't need God. And on the other hand, God's saying, you do need me. You need to listen to me. I have good in mind for you. And I need to receive with meekness. Notice it says engrafted word. Anything you, anytime you graft one, you graft trees together. Some of us have probably done that. Making two trees grow as one. When we engrafted it, they become one. God's saying, my word becomes part of you in your heart and in your mind. You begin to think like I want you to think. You begin to feel like I want you to feel. You begin to react to the world the way I want you to react. That's what God's trying to help me to understand. That's resisting the devil. If I've got God's word in my heart and on my mind, in Philippians 4, we're told to think on good and virtuous things. And you think it has a good report on these things, let your mind dwell. Paul even goes to the point in Philippians to say, let this mind which was in Christ Jesus be also now in you. If I have the mind of Christ and the feelings and thoughts of Christ, and I have the thoughts of God in my heart, I don't have room for the evil thoughts. I don't have room for the temptations which come my way, which will come, by the way. I'm not thinking about those things. I've already got a head start on resisting the devil. He's not going to have an effect on me because my mind is already where God wants it to be, on Him and receiving the engrafted word. And notice that the word, engrafted word, is able to save my soul. Save my soul from what? From the destruction, from the wrath of God, as Romans chapter 5 tells us. We are saved from the wrath of God in Christ Jesus. Justified by His blood, Romans chapter 5. I don't want to reap the wrath of God. And I don't know of anyone who does want that. When they realize that God exists and what's going to happen, how can you want that? I want to resist the devil. I don't want to be a party with him in going into everlasting destruction from the presence of God. I don't want that. So I'm going to humble myself and acknowledge God and receive that engrafted word in my heart that is able to save my soul. Look in Psalms 25 and verse 9 as a companion verse here. Psalms 25 and verse 9. The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. Humble yourselves. Meekness is being humble. Heavenly Father, I need you. Heavenly Father, I want your guidance. Heavenly Father, help me know what to do. Help me to know what to say. If we will read the scriptures, we'll find that that's a lot of times what David's asking him to do in the Psalms. He's asking God to help him to know what to do. Help him to know what to say. Paul was even concerned about this. And he's telling us, God will help you. But what do you have to do? You have to humble yourself. What is the Lord saying here in 25 verse 9 in the Psalms? He's saying that He will guide me in judgment. He will help me to know what to do. He will guide me in the way, showing me where I need to go. That's a parallel to another verse. Thy word, the engrafted word, is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. God will show me where I need to go. And beloved, that's always in the opposite the direction that the devil wants me to go. So how can I resist the devil again? By listening to God and receiving the word of God. Point number three. <clears throat> Be a doer of the word, not just a hearer only. Look at verse 22 of James 1.22. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. See, if, I'm a, if I say I'm a Christian, but I go out into the world and do what I want to do, I'm deceiving myself. I'm lying to myself. Even calling myself a Christian. I'm not following Christ. I'm following my lust. I'm out in the world doing whatever I want to do, saying whatever I want to say. I'm lying to myself when I call myself a Christian and I'm not doing what God's told me to do. 
And that's what James is saying. Don't lie to yourself. Don't listen to the devil. Who's the father of lies the devil is? So if I'm not listening to what God's telling me, who am I listening to? The devil. There's only two sources. Either it's truth and God, or it's a lie and it's the devil. Now, hard to understand that, is it? He's telling me to be a, a doer of the word. Look in verse 22. To be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Do what? Do what? Do what God has told me to do. That's what it boils down to. God's commandments. The things that he's telling me that I need to do in my life to change my life, to fashion it after the order he wants it to follow. Stop sinning. The uh, times of ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men to repent. Repent means to change. Stop doing what's wrong. Start doing what I'm telling you to do. Start listening to me. That's what God's saying. What is the devil telling you? It's on the opposite, isn't he? So, oh, if it feels good, do it. If you enjoy it, do it. You're not hurting anybody. Do whatever you want to do. That's what the devil's saying. God's saying, no, don't do that. Think of it this way. If, if every time you sinned, you hurt yourself, kind of like touching a hot stove, a hot pot on the stove, putting your hand in the fire, you're not going to do that but once. How many of us have taught our kids, don't touch that, it's hot, and they go right along and they touch it anyway, but they don't touch it again, do they? See, if sin were that way, if every time you sinned, you got, felt like you were touching something hot, you wouldn't do it anymore, would you? Because you don't want that pain that comes along with it. But sin's not that way. Sin, in some way or, uh, or fashion, gives you some kind of an enjoyment. And that's why you keep going back to it. That's why the devil can use it so easily to ply us and to lie to us and deceive us. Oh, if it feels good, you're not hurting anybody. Just do that. While on the other hand, God's saying, don't. Because the consequences of you doing that will lead you to a place you don't want to go. See, God's doing looking out for our eternal soul. Not just the here and the now. Matter of fact, the pleasures of this world, God refers to them as that, doesn't he? He calls them treasures. Lay up not treasures here, but lay up treasures where? In heaven. Listen to what he's saying. And do what he's saying. Look in Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 31 as a companion verse. Ezekiel 33, starting with verse 31. And again, we're talking about doing the word of God, not just listening. Ezekiel 33, verse 31. And they come unto thee as the people cometh. And they sit before thee as my people. And they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but in their heart go after their covetousness. In other words, they're praising God with their mouth, but they're wanting to go in, in their heart and do whatever they want to do. Look at verse 32. And lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song, of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear thy words, but they do them not. In other words, they like to hear the story. They like to hear what you're telling them to do. Oh, they'll praise you and they'll acknowledge you. But then they turn right around and go do what they want to do. That's not what God wants. God wants us to listen and do what he's telling us to do. And why is that? Because he tells you in the scriptures in the end, he wants us to be with him in heaven. Sin cannot be in the presence of God. God will not be in the presence of sin. That's why in Gospel John, he tells us very clearly, once we have obeyed his commandments and done all the things that he's told us to do, it is then that he comes to us and makes his home with us in our heart. Because once we've obeyed the gospel... And we have been baptized for the remission of our sins. 
The sin's then removed, and God then can come and dwell in our hearts where there is no sin. In the end, he wants us to be in heaven with him where there is no sin. God's ultimate desire and joy and pleasure is to see us all go to heaven. And Peter, he tells us God would that all men come to the knowledge of him and be saved. That's what God wants. The devil wants you to have fun now and enjoy it. He's telling you, you can have your cake and eat it too, beloved. That's not the case. So how do I resist the devil? I listen to God's word and I do God's word. That's what I must do. Number four. Not only do we need to hear it and do it, but we need to continue. Continue in the word of God. Look at verse 25. <clears throat> For he beholdeth himself as going his way, and straightway forgiveth what manner of man he was. I'm sorry, look at verse 24 first. 24 and then 25. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgiveth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Are you listening? We can't just be hearers only, because hearers only, just like he says, you look at yourself in a mirror, you adjust yourself, and then you go on, but you forget what you were looking at. You forget what you read. You forget what you heard. But if we listen to God's word and then go and do it, we actively participate in doing God's work. That is what then will help us to be a doer of the work and blessed in our deed, blessed in our doing. How are we blessed? God forgives us of our sins. How are we blessed? God continues with us. <clears throat> God hears our prayers. God actively responds to our prayers. God helps us to resist temptation. Did you know that that is a promise to his children and his children only? God has promised that he will not let a temptation overtake you that, not, that is such not common to man. In other words, the temptations that, will, that are tempting to every man will be the only ones that are allowed to be tempted against you. Nothing extraordinary, in other words. It will be the same as anybody else. But, he says, but with each temptation, God will provide an avenue of escape for you. He doesn't do that for everybody. He only does that for his children. That is a way in which we are blessed in doing the word of God. Look with me to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 15. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 12, and verse 15, as a companion verse. He says, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. You see, there's some out in the world that teach you can't fall from grace. Just right there, he says very clearly that you can fail. You can fall. Paul himself was concerned about falling from grace. He says, lest I should fall. He had to buffet his body daily. In other words, he forced himself to comply with what God had commanded him to do. Because he didn't want to fall from grace. If, God is, if Paul is concerned about falling from grace, are we not to be concerned? That doesn't mean you lose your place in heaven permanently. You can always repent and come home again. But if you fall from grace, it means you've chosen to go down a path in which God does not approve of. And you have made that decision. God does not forcibly remove you. You remove yourself. As a matter of fact, one of the scriptures says, you have fallen from grace. God didn't remove you. You removed yourself. It's because you didn't continue in the Word of God. 
That's how important it is. I can't resist the devil if I'm not in Christ. I can't resist the devil if I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I can't resist the, the devil if not, I am not rooted in the truth. Listen to what the writer of Hebrews is saying. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. I need to continue and pay attention. Watch what I'm doing. Paul talks about looking at yourself. He says, examine yourself daily, whether you be in the faith. You look at yourself. You look at the Word of God. This is what God's telling me to do. Am I doing that? Am I continuing in the Word? Am I doing what God's asked me to do? How can I resist the devil if I'm doing what the devil wants me to do? That's complying with the devil, isn't it? God wants me to resist the devil. He wants me to go against the devil. Resist him and he what? He will flee from you. In other words, he will have no effect on you. Eventually he's going to give up. He'll come back and try again later, but he's going to give up. We have a perfect example of that in Christ Jesus himself when he was being tempted. The devil was tempting him. The devil knows what the scriptures say. He was using the scriptures against Christ. He told him to go out and look out into all the world. He took him up on top of the temple and said, Look at all this. If you will bow down and worship me, I will give all this to you. And of course, what did the Lord say? He responded with what? The scriptures, the word. It is written, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Right. What about eating food? He's tempted to turn his stones into bread. Man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Every time he was tempted, he resisted the devil. And then in the end, what happens? The devil left him. The devil will leave when we resist. The key is we have to resist. We have to steadfastly stay with what God has asked us to do and do what God's asked us to do and the devil will flee from us. Look at verse 26, point number five. Point number five. Verse 26. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but receiveth his own, deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. In other words, empty, meaningless. If you can't control your mouth and what you say, then you're defeating yourself. We have to control our mouth. We have to control what we say. We have to be careful because God tells us very carefully how we should talk. Speak in love. Teach in love. Let our words be seasoned with salt. In other words, seasoned with the Word of God. We need to know what we need to do and how we need to talk. Look in Colossians 4 and verse 6 as a companion verse. Colossians 4 and verse 6. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. How you should talk to anybody. How can I claim to be a child of God and every other word be one of profanity? How can I say I'm a child of God and I'm speaking insulting comments to someone? Christ died for that person just as he died for me. How can I degrade someone? How can I talk down to someone? How can I belittle someone? How can I say that someone's not worthy of the grace that God has extended to that person? In my language, when Christ died for that person just as he did for me. I can't do that and say I'm a child of God. I need to control what I say. Because my words are powerful. God's words are powerful. He spoke the world into existence. My words are powerful in bringing down the walls the devil has built up in someone's heart. My words are powerful to edify someone into believing in Christ. My words are powerful in someone believing that God loves them. 
My words are powerful to help them and encourage them to resist the devil. Your words are powerful. Choose your words wisely. And just as God said in Colossians 4, let them be seasoned with salt. Seasoned with the word of God. Controlling what you're saying so that you can help that person in turn resist the devil and be saved. That is your duty. That is your responsibility. That's why he says that you may know how you ought to answer every man. How do you need to talk to people? Paul himself said, I am all things to all men that I may what? Save something. Whatever he needed to say, whatever he needed to do. Not that he lied, but he listened. Slow to speak. He listened. He learned what people like, what people enjoy. And he accommodated what they liked and enjoyed. Got into a conversation with them about those things. Learned from them and in turn shared the gospel with them. You can be all things to all men. But you might win some as well. Listen to what you're saying. Be careful what you say. Help others to learn. Point number six and number seven. We need to meet the needs of the afflicted. Look at verse 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. To visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. If my mind is focused on doing good, I'm helping those who are in need. I don't have time to think about bad things. The devil might try and tempt me, but no, I'm on a mission. I'm to do what God asked me to do. I am here to help people. All the time that Christ was here, all everywhere he went, everything he did, he helped someone. He taught them the gospel. He taught them the truth. He fed them. He helped them. Whatever need they had, he helped fulfill that need. We are to have the mind of Christ. Therefore, we need to be thinking along the same lines. What are we told here by James? Pure religion, that is undefiled, clean and simple, exactly what it needs to be, is to what? Visit the fatherless, they are in need. They have no one to provide for them, help them, and the widows in their affliction, they have no one to help them at that day and time. We are to help people. And what is the major need the world has? The world needs Christ. The world needs to understand that God loves them, and we are to take the gospel to them. That is the primary way we are to help people. Help them in their affliction. How are they being afflicted? The devil is taunting them. He has them entrapped in the law of sin and death, and they're condemned, and we're to free them. And the only way we can free them is to teach them the gospel so that they might respond and become children of God. Christ frees them. We are the instrument that they need to receive that message. That is the primary way we are to help people. And to keep ourselves uncontaminated from sin. To be unspotted from the world means I don't have anything to do with anything in the world that God doesn't agree with. It's not hard to understand that. Look in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 18. It's a companion verse. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 18. We know that whosoever is born of God, in other words, they have become a child of God. They're born again, born of water and of the Spirit. This is what we're told in John. John chapter 3. Born of the water, born of baptism, born a new man. Having our sins washed away. Acts 22, 16. Washing and regeneration, as it tells us in Titus. Getting rid of that sin. That's being reborn. For we're buried like Christ was buried, raised, newness of life, born again. That's what that means. Everything's fresh and starting over. <clears throat> Not hard to understand that. And notice what it says in 1 John 5, 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. It doesn't mean we don't sin. It means we've had a change of mind and a change of heart. And we're not out purposely to sin. We might make a mistake. We might stumble. We might fall. We're not perfect. But we have the blood of Christ to cover our sins. And just as it says in 1 John, if we're faithful to what? Confess our faults. 
He will what? Forgive us our sins. For the blood of Christ covers our sin. It is an eternal sacrifice. It's always there. For when we make a mistake, we have to confess it and repent. And the blood is still there. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself. How do I keep myself? I study the word of God. I focus on what God wants me to know and understand. I listen to his word. I listen to his encouragement. I listen to his chastisement. When he tells me I'm doing something wrong, I stop doing that. I pray right then. I have a mind and attitude of prayer. I pray without ceasing. I meditate on God's word. God's word is engrafted into my heart. I belong to God and I study his word. That's what that's saying. I keep myself, and the only way I can keep myself is to let God be the one who leads me. I follow what He's telling me to do. I'm listening to Him. He's guiding my steps. He maketh my path that I follow. I'm not listening to the devil. Oh, the devil's in the audience. He's taunting. He's yelling, hey, look at me over here. Pay attention to this. Look what you're missing. No, I keep saying to myself, I'm not missing anything. Where I'm going is up there. My mind and my thoughts, my gaze, my focus is on heaven and Christ and pleasing Him. That is, after all, why we are here. The Bible clearly tells us we are here to please God. That is our purpose. That's why we are here. Notice what it says there in 1 John 5, 18. Look carefully. And the wicked one, who is the wicked one? The devil. The wicked one toucheth him not. That's how you resist the devil. I put God first. I listen to what James is telling me here. I focus on doing what is right. I listen to the word of God. And when that devil comes around and he tempts me, he tries me, I respond with the word of God. See, the word of God is our sword. It's our only offensive weapon. Everything else is a shield or to protect me. Helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, guardeth my loins with the truth, for shall my feet for the preparation of the gospel, and the shield of faith, and the sword of truth. The sword is my weapon. That's how I will fend off the devil. I use the sword. And if I'm not studying it, I don't know about the sword, I don't know how to use the sword, how can I fend off the devil? I can't. This is how we resist the devil. This is the way in which we are to resist the devil. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's what God's trying to tell you. He needs to give you a perfect lesson right here in James of exactly how to do that. I hope this lesson has helped you to understand that resisting the devil is a possibility and God has provided you with a means of doing so. God loves you. God cares. What he wants is for you to love him back. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. God wants you to hear the gospel. God wants you to have faith in him. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. To confess that faith before men, to repent of your sins, to be baptized for the remission of your sins. And then the Lord himself will come unto you and make an abode of you. God loves you. We certainly do. Demonstrate your love for him. Would you come? While together we invite you in song.